morning, good morning. And I just wanted to welcome you this morning. I am pretty excited about this particular topic, um, largely because this topic kind of came about organically. Uh, as Jesse and I have been reintroducing ourselves with the artifacts that are owned by the museum, we started cleaning out the conservatory in early January, and we started with Riceburg memorabilia. And we came across a particular name, and we kept seeing information on this young lady. And when I pulled the records, it wasn't a name that I was familiar with, but there was another name on that record, and that was Minnie Stravelin. And so I was like, you know, we're trying to figure out who this woman was, and Tommy happened to come by. I said, so Tommy, who's Minnie Strabler? Who is Catherine Davis? And he said, that's my Aunt Kate. So we kind of got going, looking into who Aunt Kate was and what she did. And Jesse came up with the idea of doing our Coffee with Curator in March based on the ladies, Lady Rice Burnett's and March Madness and Women's History Month and the phenomenal cast of characters that have come out of that program and what they've gone on to do in their lives. So, um, I thank you for coming. With that, I'll introduce Jesse Walsh. Hi. <laughs> new, new topic, new faces, and a new microphone. <laughs> um, so, like she said, you know, th this has come about very organically and from, you know, relationships that we've, that we've developed here at Coffee. And, um, I do have to kind of preface this with a disclaimer that whenever I first started researching this, I was pretty sure that, you know, the object of basketball is to get a ball in a hoop. And now that I've been looking through this, um, looking into this for a few weeks now, I'm, I can very confidently say that the objective is to get a ball through a hoop. <laughs> but I've learned as much as I can in this time. <laughs> And um, I'm also pretty sure that some folks may be surprised to know that the Rice Burdettes go back a bit further than, than they realized, because I know I was a little shocked. Um, this is the first, um, this is the earliest record of the Rice Burdettes that we have here in our collection. This is a picture from 1923. Um, and that's pretty convenient for me because that allowed me to give this presentation a you know, snappy title like, you know, Rice Burdett's 100 years on the court. <laughs> and uh, one of the main resources that we've used for this has been our annual collection, which doesn't start until the 1930s, but we were still able to dig up some info about the teens of the 20s. And so for starters, we do know these ladies' names. Um, they are Sophia Voss, Ruby Freeman, Louise Worsing, Ruby Mitzel, Catherine Layton, Selma Brewer, and that's Coach Ruby Henderson on the right. So Ruby was a very popular name. We learned that too. <laughs> and we also know about the larger context that these girls were playing in, because by this point, basketball was already pretty popular, um, had gotten popular very quickly, and had spread to schools all over the country. And there were Arkansas State Championships going back as early as 1912. And, and women's basketball has existed basically as long as the sport itself has existed. The first women's team was formed the year after the sport was invented in 1891. And clearly, the uniforms were different than they look today. <laughs> Those are actual bloomers. Um, and that was pretty standard between 1890s and the 1920s. Uh, when I was reading up on the overall history of the sport, I found this tidbit that I thought was kind of funny. Um, in the first ever intercollegiate game, women's game, which was between Stanford and Berkeley, uh, men were excluded from watching the game. And they even had some ladies guarding the windows, that way no one could be looking at the ladies in their bloomers. <laughs> and um, you may have noticed on your way in that we have a, a have a uniform that comes with bloomers on display, and that uniform is from around 1926. And that's just about the latest that you'll see bloomers like that um, being part of the uniform. In this picture from 1928, you can kind of see how the, the shorts have changed. They're kind of this half bloomer, half short hybrid. Um, so they're, they're a little closer to what we see now, but still longer. And 
that brings us to the 1930s. And the first player that I'd like to highlight, you know, I kind of gave you a hint of what was in store. Um, the first player we're going to talk about is Kate Davis. And Kate is really the one that sparked our interest in the topic. It was her jacket that we talked to Tom, Tommy about. And her story made us want to learn more about the history of the Burnettes. Uh, Kate graduated from Stuckart High in 1935. And at the time, she was regarded as possibly the best female athlete that Stuckart High had ever had at that point. Um, not only was she team captain in her senior year, but um, when uh, they suddenly found themselves without a coach, she filled in as coach and, and led her team to victory in that. And that's a picture um, after, after that game. So she's acting as coach over there on the right. Left, my right? No, it's not. <laughs> um, she's the one in the dress. Yes, the one that's not in the uniform. <laughs> And you'll see here that her yearbook quote was, she is given to sports and sports and sports. And that's, that's not an exaggeration at all, because <laughs> not only was she a great basketball player, but she was a gifted athlete throughout her life, playing a, a wide variety of sports. Um, after high school, she played basketball alongside Hazel Walker, who would later go on to form the Arkansas Travelers. And of course, I'm not talking about the baseball team here. Um, Hazel Walker's Arkansas Travelers, um, for those who may not know, um, they were a touring women's team that, you know, in a, in a time when there wasn't a professional league for women, and they were playing men's teams, and they, they won a lot. <laughs> um, uh, that team itself has a very cool story, and, and I'd encourage you guys to learn more about that. I think PBS covered it um, in a program. But anyway, back to Kate. <laughs> In the 1940s, Kate started playing for Stuttgart's uh, softball team, women's softball team. And I know a lot of folks, you know, remember that or, or have heard of that. She also golfed and bowled for many years. She was such a good bowler that she often made the gazette for her accomplishments in that. You know, she won a lot. And she just mm. excelled in every sport she tried, as far as I know. <laughs> and um, every sport I've ever heard of her trying, she did well, and she gave it her all when she decided to do something. And we also know that Kate had a very dry sense of humor and was always laughing, always happy. Um, and her family has shared with us that she didn't just like to play sports, but also read about them, that she had books on just about every sport there is, uh, and would use the, those books to sometimes help <laughs> folks who wanted to learn how to play, such as Tommy. <laughs> um, and it's clear that, the, that her time as a rice bird debt meant a lot to her because she continued to be involved with the team even after she graduated. Um, she was the officiator for all of the games in 1939, and she also was a, was a guest of honor that year um, at, a, at a dinner that was thrown by the coaches. And 1939 was also a really good year for the Burdettes because they had all these new star players like Ruth Henderson and um, Betty Yoder, who was team captain for that year. And that year they were district champions. And to celebrate the end of a great season, the team actually gave the coaches these little gold souvenir basketballs. And I, I wish we had one. <laughs> that would be cool for our collection. And that kind of brings us to the 1940s. The teams of the 40s didn't record much, uh, as much detailed information as the 30s did. But we do have highlights from that decade overall. In 1940, they made it all the way to the district finals, but sadly lost. And then from this photo, we can see that they went to the district um, tournament, the district conference again in 1944. Um, and that is the year that Olam's old school won. But the next season in 1945, the girls suddenly found themselves without a coach again. And luckily for them, Miss Betty Martin stepped up and led the girls through the season. And it must have been a big season for Miss Martin because not only was she handling that, but she was also over the girls' physical education program. And that was the first year they did that. Um, and they had 150 girls enrolled. <laughs> By the time we get to the 1950s, uh, the Rice Burdettes have gone to the district tournament several times, but lost each time. 
But in 1951, that finally changed. Uh, that season, the Rice Burnettes took the title as District 6 champs, beating Mariana, Mariana's team 47 to 39. And the school paper, the Rice Bird, had this to say about the game. It says here, Coach Mitchell's girls showed up with one of their best games of the season. The forwards kept the Mariana girls guessing with their fast passes while the guards bottled up Jernigan's shots. Barry was high point for the Burdettes with 21 points. And the Barry that that references is Mary Sue Barry. Uh, not only did she play a big role in making the Rice Burdettes uh, district champions that year, she was also named an all-district player that year. And one look at Mary's yearbook will tell us that basketball was really just the beginning. It was really just the tip of the iceberg for her. She was, and I'm looking down because I've got a list. <laughs> she was the student conductor and drum major of the band. Uh, she was also an orchestra and glee club, booster club, squ quill and scroll. She was vice president and secretary for the Latin club. Uh, she was an annual editor, and she was even a Halloween maid in the beauty pageant that they did. Or, you know. And that's, that's not even the whole list. I, I stopped trying. I just picked the highlights. <laughs> um, her yearbook quote is fittingly, she originated the word versatile. And her list of extracurriculars gives us a pretty big hint as to what she went on to do after graduation. She became a musician. And a little while later, in 1967, she married another musician named Robert Hawk. Uh, he was from New York, and they went there together to you know, pursue their careers and their lives together. Uh, I've been doing some cyber stalking, and it looks like they still live in New York, but that's kind of where I stopped. So I was starting to feel creepy. <laughs> I'm not used to doing presentations on people who are still with us. <laughs> so I decided to quit. Um, and then nothing. You know, I, I was scouring several yearbooks thinking that I was going either blind or crazy and our, our other records, especially the yearbooks. And I just didn't find any mention of the girls' basketball team at all. And that's because there wasn't a team between 1960 and 1966. Um, and the reason for that is something we've been working to figure out. You know, we've been talking to people and seeing what happened. And, you know, there was a big push towards the Marching 100 at that time. It was really popular. And just other contributing factors kind of in the, in the larger stories of what was going on in schools. Um, and so we kind of wonder how those factors played together to, to make that happen. But whatever the case, um, the girls basketball team was on hiatus for a few years. And then in the 1966 to 67 school year, they formed a new team. And this group of girls played for a sort of partial season, and they, were, and they didn't compete with other schools. Uh, the high school just wanted to test the waters to make sure that there was enough interest to keep the program going. And evidently there was. Uh, the response from the school was, was so encouraging that the very next season, they bumped up the number of games to a full season and started competing again. And the player on the right here is Mary Glenn. Uh, you'll find her Stuttgart High blanket in our display. Um, she was part of that 67 basketball team as well as the track team. She's remembered as you know a great player and, and a great friend. Uh, sadly, Mary was taken from her community too soon. She was killed in an accident during her junior year. Um, but her friends and family ensured that her legacy would leave a positive impact for the, for the Rice Burnettes. And after her death, folks created a fundraiser to supply the team with new uniforms. And the Rice Burnettes were, you know, by this point in time, the Rice Burnettes were officially back in business. And it, it really didn't take long to rebound. You know, they were very confident with the girls that they had. Um, they were making fast progress. And then we get to the 1970s, and it's almost like this, <laughs> just, just reading it, it's almost like this golden age. The teams of the late 60s, and early 70s, were led by Coach Moncrief. Uh, that's her right there. Um, and she, you know, during her time, she guided so many excellent players. You know, just to name a few would be Nancy Hula, Kay Ferguson, uh, Kathy and Linda Hobbs, uh, the list could have gone on. But there's one more remarkable player that I'd like to tell you guys about today, and that is Helen Hughes. Helen was in the graduating class of 76, 
and she was just an incredible player. During her time as the Rice Burdette, she once scored 57 points in one game. Oh. <laughs> and um, it, she ended the 1975 season with, as the highest score of the team, did I say 77, I meant 75, uh, with 467 points. So naturally, a lot of colleges wanted her to play for them. <laughs> And she ended up choosing University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. And she had a really great run there. In her freshman year, she was, uh, Hughes was the only UAPB player named to the, the first all Arkansas Women's Intercollegiate Sports Association um, team. And she was among one of the early players for the women's NBA for a short time. Um, after that, she, came home to Arkansas and married James Smith. She's, she passed away in 2021. And in 2007, Helen was inducted into the UAPB Sports Hall of Fame. Skipping ahead a little bit, we were really only able to cover the first 50-ish years of the Rice Burdett's story today. <laughs> and I just wanted to bring us back to the present for a minute because with anything that has lots of people behind it, you know, passing the torch from one generation to the next. I always think it's cool to see, to see that legacy. And, you know, each of the people we've highlighted here today, you know, they, uh, they made their own mark on their community, both during their Burdett years and throughout life. And when you look at sports teams and look back, you can really see these echoes of the, of the past, you know, that passion for the game and uh, pride in the community, it, it just carries on. There have been so many players over the course of this history's team, you know, you can see just by looking through the photos and the, the memorabilia that there are many, many stories to be told here. And, you know, more and more stories than I could ever hope to cover in just one program. But that's why we're glad to have you guys here, um, to have you guys with us, and uh, to, to know folks who carry these stories with them. And we always like to encourage people to share their memories with us and share their stories. That way we can help, help tell them, help spread them.